Okay, good morning everyone. Um, my name is Adele Kirsten. I'm with Gun Free South Africa and I'll be chairing the session. We have three speakers uh, this morning and it will be Anthony Collins uh, and then Paul Haltzhausen and Karen Milford. It, I was a bit late but uh, I did manage to hear Crane Sudin say something important and Guy reinforcing it, which was that this is a really important space for us to begin to listen to each other and to engage with each other, whether it's as academics, uh, as health professionals, as practitioners. And I think I've, I've gone through the abstracts of the three papers <laughs> and the order is quite deliberate. Um, because Anthony will really engage us in a sort of theoretical understanding of violence, how it happens and why it happens. As a practitioner uh, myself, uh, we don't spend enough time engaging with the issue of how and why violence happens. And of course we have a rich history uh, of this. I mean, right from Gandhi, both his analysis of violence and his action, but we have Hannah Arendt, who talked about the banality of evil and violence as an everyday, the everydayness of violence. And then, of course, we had Johann Gultung, who spoke about violence being learned as a learned behavior. And then Paulo Freire, who talks about political exclusion and the inability of people to make decisions about their day to day life as a form of violence. And in fact, that panel is going to be looking at a lot of that. So we have a rich history uh, to draw on. And then, of course, more recently, the World Health Organization, and its understanding of violence, and in particular violence prevention, the, the ecological model. So we have a rich history to draw on. But I think we make a mistake if we think that that's the place where it stops. Uh, and I'm really hoping that the panel this morning will help us engage at it from different perspectives, because they definitely come from different perspectives. They have different understandings and views, certainly from looking at the abstract. And so I would ask you as participants that you listen and engage, uh, and there will be time for question and answer. So people will have 20 minutes max, and then hopefully we'll have about 30 minutes for discussion rather than Q&A uh, and then we'll break for tea. Okay, so I'm going to, and I'm not going to introduce the speakers, you can do that as part of um, your own introduction, plus it's clear where they come from uh, on, on the uh, program. So Anthony, I'm going to hand over to you. Because I, I prefer not to use the mic, there's enough noise in the world <laughs> already. Um, okay, so I'm Anthony Collins. Uh, I've been based at the so-called University of KwaZulu-Natal, but as of next year I will be at um, Rhodes. So if you're looking for me in the future, that's where, to, that's where you should go. Um, and um, I'm, my paper today is entitled Learning to Love Violence. And it's really um, a theoretical um, look at the at why South Africa continues to be a violent society. But it's not a theoretical overview. I, I, I try to map out a kind of a, 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 a broad set of what I think are faulty assumptions and then give a very, very small little technical addition that seems to have got historically lost and just try and reinsert that. So it's not a kind of a big explanatory paper. It's just saying, well, there's this other little idea out there um, and what if we brought that back in and added it to the, 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 the many really interesting and useful theories we've got at the moment. Um, so my work is, it sort of happens in that moment before we go out and do the research and before we go out and do the applied social interventions to really stop and say, how do we think about violence? When, by the time we're doing our interventions and our research, we've already got a whole lot of of, of, of assumptions about what violence is and um, what effective violence reduction mechanisms would look like. Um, and I'm interested in some of those because there seems to be a, a, a complex network of kind of popular ideas, um, scientific ideas, political ideas, um, and, and I think a lot of them are wrong. Um, and so I'm developing a, 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 a kind of uh, look at this in, a, in, in this book that I'm working on at the moment called One Bloody Thing After Another, Understanding Violence in South Africa. 
Um, and the assumptions I want to look at today, um, there are three key ones. The first is that most violence is related to property crimes. Now, probably no one in this room believes that, but the general public very deeply believe that, as do the government, apparently. Um, that, and they think about violence in terms of, of, of criminality, which is, uh, um, those of us who are sort of aware of the research data know that that's not really the, the overwhelming site of violence. Um, the other is a, is a more kind of tacit assumption that, that, that's somehow related to that, is that there's a clear distinction to be made between the kind of uh, good people and bad people, that there's a clear distinction between violent criminals and those of us in the room who are good people who you know, pay our taxes and go to work and, and try and solve social problems. And, and somehow we can sort of conceptually uh, see a, a clear demarcation between offenders and, and, and victims um, socially. And, and I think that's a completely wrong conceptualization that leads us to a lot of mistakes as well. Um, and the third assumption, which I think is even sort of deeper tacit assumption, which I want to challenge, is that most South Africans would prefer to live in a less violent society. And that, that statement seems to have just such a weight of obviousness. Obviously, everyone would prefer to live in a less violent society. That's why we moan about violent crime so much. And, and in fact, I think, that, I think that assumption is wrong. I think South Africans want to live in a in a violent society. And, and I think when we look at the empirical evidence, that, that, that critique can be backed up very, very strongly. Um, so here's my counter argument. Most South Africans support and are deeply invested in the use of violence for social um, negotiation and problem solving. Um, for instance, in the press in the last week, there's been a resurgence of this idea of banning corporal punishment. And the South Africans are overwhelmingly against it. An online survey last week had 94% of uh, people being in favor of retaining corporal punishment uh, as a means of regulating children. Okay, so, so, these are, so there's an incredibly high level of consensus. The same thing happened in 2007 when they tried to get the, the Children's Act through Parliament. Every single political party, from ANC to Freedom Front, opposed the uh, idea of eliminating uh, violence um, against children uh, to regulate their behavior. There's, there, there, there's just, I mean, one never sees that level of support for, for almost any policy as there is for retaining the right of adults to be violent towards children. Um, the, uh, interesting research has been done by people like um, Rachel Jukes on, on the use of violence in sexual negotiation. Um, the findings there are with, amongst young South Africans majority, about 60%, are actively in favor, and this includes boys and girls, are actively in favor of the use of, of, of violence in sexual negotiations. Um, that, okay, actively in favor is not, that's actually a bad wording, it's, 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 it's that they, 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 they accept it um, as being reasonable. Um, so that's an important part of, the, um, of understanding that, that in, in, in the kind of domain of sexuality, which is extremely significant in the, in the light of the HIV epidemic, the use of violence and coercion is normalized, and it is seen as, as an acceptable form of, of conduct. And it's interesting because um, one of the things that, the, 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 that we've got to confront in making this argument is that parallel to this argument is also the kind of argument of the scandal of violence, the scandal of South African rape, um, the scandal of Anine Boersons. Um, and, and the difficulty is, 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 is showing that within those notions of rape, there is in fact a totally um, normalized idea that, that coercion should exist within the domain of sexuality. Um, the other um, huge area of violence, of course, is within intimate relationships. Um, uh, intimate partner violence, domestic violence, these are also highly normalized um, aspects of South African life. And there is a, a widespread acceptance of violence as a way of, of managing things like masculine jealousy, um, uh, um, of, of resolving frustration and, and establishing authority in, in relationships. Another place that South Africans really love violence is um, with law enforcement. Um, that most of the research is looking at 70 to 80 percent support for the return of the death penalty, which is perhaps the ultimate form of, of, uh, of state violence, and um, even higher support for introduction of, of harsher, more punitive um, sort of uh, legal punishments for criminals. And uh, 
widespread endorsement of, of, of police brutality. And this is interesting because this is one of those things that also has a, an ambivalence to it. There, there are moments of scandal around police br brutality. When a middle class white woman gets shot while parking at a police station, everyone's horrified by that. But when we see images of car hijackers being shot by the police, then there's enormous public support for those those images. So underneath the, the, the ostensible scandal and, and, and critique of, of, of um, police brutality is in fact a deep sympathy. Um, and the idea that these shoot to kill policies um, that, that are, are not simply invented by politicians, these are populist policies. The reason why people like Becky Dele want to change um, the law to, to allow um, police to uh, publicly execute civilians is because that's what the public wants. Um, so there's a, there's a deep sympathy for um, this kind of state violence in the form of law enforcement and, of course, vigilante violence. Um, the other area of that, those of, I, I'm not a Cape Townian, so I didn't, I didn't watch this all going down, is, is in, in the area of labor disputes and political contestation. In town this week, we saw an example of the, um, the, the use of violence to, uh, to criticize um, sort of social and political policies. And this is also a very, very common part of, of South African life. And there was some research done a couple of months ago um, looking at the use of violence in social protests where, the, where the, the people interviewed basically said, if you, don't, you, if you don't become violent in your social protests, they aren't taken seriously, so they're fundamentally ineffective. So w once again, there's a kind of a sense of, of the necessity and legitimacy of, of violence as a, as a way of, social, of, of political negotiation. Um, also, as a way of economic assertion, not only in the kind of obvious way of criminal violence dealing stuff, but the, the way it emerges in things like xenophobia, um, that it's okay to kill people because they are uh, infringing on our economic activities, they're taking our jobs away from us. Um, and perhaps one of the most widespread kind of sites of, of violence is the use of violence for maintaining identity. And this is particularly linked to masculinity. The way in which violence is used to, to assert kind of masculine dignity, authority, to, to retaliate against kind of um, uh, 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 insults to the self. Um, and we see this in everything from bullying through to the, through the patterns of homicide, that most homicides in South Africa are in fact escalating disputes. They're not uh, sort of linked to property crimes. They, they start with someone, you know, you check me skiff and they end up with someone dead. That's a, that, that idea of violence as a, as a legitimate way of defending the self against a, 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 a indignity or insult seems to be deeply embedded into, into our culture. So that, that's my argument for the fact that, that South Africans love violence. They don't want a, 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 a less... Um, they, they, they don't want violence stripped away as a resource in this society. And of course, there's a whole lot of work that's been done for decades now on, on, on how people um, learn violence. How, um, and th I suppose the big model that, 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 that many people in the social sciences use is a kind of social learning model, initially sort of developed out of a behaviorist um, model that said, well, people learn violence because it's rewarded, that they actually ach positively achieve goals by being violent, and so it's, uh, it's a rewarded activity. But then that became a sort of more sophisticated notion that people learn it by modeling and observation. More sociological models talk about the, the normalization of violence. Once it becomes a social norm, it sort of perpetuates itself as a social norm, and I think that's also a very interesting port and important way of doing it kind of critical social models looking at the ideological maintenance of violence, the way in which explanatory systems in our society um, justify the use of violence. Well, if you, if you don't beat your kids when they're naughty, they'll grow up to be delinquent. So to prevent criminality, we actually have to be violent towards children. That kind of explanatory system that, that justifies and normalizes um, violence. That, 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 that the reason there's so much criminality is because we don't have the death penalty, we don't have enough deterrence. Um, and, and, and they function in this explanatory kind of slash ideological way. Um, and then, of course, uh, the other thing that has to be going on for, 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 the, for, for this um, um, perpetuation of violence is the absence of alternatives, both the absence of um, uh, kind of critiques of, of the systems of violence, and that's precisely why I'm trying to introduce this critique, 
and the absence of alternative frameworks. And many of you are, in fact, directly involved with the development of alternative frameworks for doing the kind of work that violence does using other nonviolent means. Um, but of course, someone is going to give the common sense objection at this place is that but people really don't like being victimized and living in fear. I mean, this is the South African bleat, the complaint that we, we, we so upset that we live in such a violent society and, and there's so much risk and we're so scared. Um, but that's exactly where the sort of conceptual knife needs to come in. And we need to say that being opposed to being victimized is not at all the same thing as being opposed to violence. We really need to clarify that distinction um, and, and to go further in that and say, in fact, the primary justification for many forms of violence is precisely to protect ourselves against victimization. The reason we want police brutality, the death penalty, um, all of those kinds of things is to make ourselves allegedly safer. Um, but it, but it, it's really worth um, spending some time dwelling on that distinction between not wanting to be a victim and not wanting to live in a violent society. Those are two different things that are at the heart of this analysis. So having, having sort of set out that broad problematic, I'm just going to do a very, very small theoretical addition to something that I think is interesting, um, uh, a, a, a way of thinking. With, and and it's... it's that is kind of unpopular. I mean, psychodynamic theory is, 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 isn't really very popular and widespread in this field, but I think it, 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 it adds a, a, a one dimension that I find quite useful. And one of the things that it's become sort of part of popular culture is this idea of how victims become perpetrators. And so we have this kind of lay trauma model, which is like, oh, well, because he was abused as a child, he ended up being a serial killer. And there's a kind of an intuitive psychoanalytic framework there um, about the psychodynamic processes that are going on that make a victim become a, 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 a perpetrator. And so just to go over the sort of, the, the, the sort of tacit um, assumptions there, um, firstly, this idea is that, that traumatic experiences, and this is perhaps the founding concept of psychoanalysis, traumatic experiences are forced out of consciousness because they are too painful to bear. But the second linked idea is that once th they continue to exist outside consciousness, they don't just dematerialize, they carry on being, ha having a, 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 a kind of uh, existence and, and powerful effects that then act back on the way that people think and feel um, and act, um, but without that um, uh, being carried through kind of conscious awareness and intention. And, that, and, and that's why they, 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 they're so interesting. Um, and so the, 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 the third assumption there is that this, this then leads people to reenact their traumatic experiences either in the role of the victim or perpetrator. Um, so people then try and sort of manage that uh, the, 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 the excluding that painful experience either by trying to repeat the victimization until they master it or, by or, 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 or re to repeat the experience where they are the perpetrator, not the victim. And that puts them in a powerful position where they can manage their emotion. Um, I'm already way behind here, so I'm not going to finish this presentation. Um, it, and of course, it also in sort of stressful situation leads to these eruptions of the repressed emotion, the kind of return of the repressed in these kind of situations of rage that escalate into acts of, of, of violence. Um, but within that broad psychodynamic theory, there's also another little theory um, of identification with the aggressor that interests me. And this sort of, when I, I suppose my, my sort of critical social thinking started when I, when I was about 12, when I went to high school. And I was really amazed by the relation to violence that existed around me. And one of the things that amazed me is being a kind of new kid in the school and being terrorized uh, by the older students, being beaten up and humiliated and all that kind of thing. And what interested me is that the other guys in the class, you know, obviously they were feeling very upset and stressed by all of this, but their reaction to it interested me, is that they had no interest in dismantling the system of violence in the school. Their reaction to it was just wait until I'm in matric. Okay. And it seemed to me that that assertion is profoundly interesting and not enough work has been done in looking at that. And, and in fact, what I'm trying to do in this paper is simply to explain that statement. Just wait until I'm in matric, see what I will do to those, those, those youngsters. Um, so 
and, 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 uh, with, with, and, and trying to understand that, I mean, most of us are familiar with the notion of the Stockholm Syndrome, this idea that, that, that um, hostages taken captive uh, after they're released, the, you know, their lives are threatened, and, and they talk in these idealistic ways about their captors. Oh, they treated us very well. And they, they gave us meals and they let us go to the toilet. And, they, and you're like, well, but, but they were holding a gun to your head and they were about to kill you all the time. What about that? And people seem to like evaporate that part of the experience in favor of simply remembering these kind of trivial, um, optimistic um, uh, things like the fact that they were actually fed. Linked to that, this very, very common kind of experience of, of um, abused women staying in abusive relationships, returning to abusive relationships, when people try and critique the abuser, they get very angry, that, yeah, you don't understand, no, he's not really like that, he's actually really good and kind, and it's only under this situation when he lost his job and he's been drinking. And so there's kind of idealization going on there. And the other is that um, this interesting idea, all kids tend to abuse their parents, um, tend to idealize their parents in some kind of way, but abused kids actually idealize their parents more. To the extent that clinically, like extreme idealization is actually a, 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 a warning sign that there may be some kind of abuse going on. So, so how do we explain all of that? And the notion of identification with the aggressor, which was um, initially developed by Sandor Ferenzi. Interestingly, um, all the literature says it was developed by Anna Freud, which is just wrong. I mean, this is just this wrong tradition in the literature. Um, that she essentially stole it from Ferenzi, who, who was kicked out of the psychoanalytic movement and became persona non grata because he critiqued some of their, their fundamental um, sort of Freudian dogma. Um, and he, in fact, said that it should be called introjection of the aggressor, which I, I'll talk about on another day because I'm out of time. So.